address theology, philosophy, and anything else that gets brought up regarding society. We are on Apple Podcasts and Podbean. We may post this one to YouTube just to get you guys um, aware of where we're at. Um, just search Cook, Cook and Swig to find us. Um, I have Cook here uh, in part one, Demonic Clouds of Oregon. We discussed why Cook, why Cook moved away. And the primary reason he gave us was that Oregon has a demonic cloud above it. No, that's not actually why, but we did discuss that. Um, it was because of his children. And so let's just kind of circle back to that. Um, why are children worth, worth uh, moving for? Uh, because we were uh, created to have children. Um, God's design for humanity is to procreate and to have children. Uh, this is fairly obvious from the... So is that a meaning of life question? Like if someone's, you know, you Google, what's the meaning of life that the Joe Cook answer is to have children? Uh, that would be a descriptor of what it means to live in the fullness of what God created us to be. Having children is a very large, having family is a very large part of that. Okay. And unfortunately, uh, not every uh, one can have children. Um, and this is why historically in Christianity and Judaism and the ancient world, uh, barrenness has always been seen as sort of a, a tragedy um, today. Maybe a curse, maybe even a curse. Maybe a curse. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. Uh, today, on the other hand, uh, barrenness is looked at as some sort of, uh, some sort of opportunity for celebration well, yeah because then you have more money to you know be stable you have exactly. more time to have fun yep yeah so so you can basically just be a a selfish a-hole your whole life um instead of just the the first part so um yes maybe i shouldn't have said that <laughs> no, that's all right you can still you can still be a you can still be selfish uh even as a parent but it is it is kind of difficult sometimes <laughs> It's a lot more difficult to be selfish as a parent. Um, some people are really good at being selfish parents, which is not a good <laughs> thing to be good at. Uh, but um, having children, um, it was surprises me to some extent um, after I had them, how much, I mean, you just can't be uh, as much as you would otherwise. Uh, and so, but ultimately, um, we tend to focus lots of times on the, our immediate pleasure and gratification, you know, almost a utilitarian conception of, of the purpose of life is to experience pleasure. Um, and to some extent, uh, rather than pleasure, I, I think, again, like uh, just a, a certain amount of uh, maybe joyfulness more broadly. Um, but oftentimes, as with anything or any vice, uh, the initial sensation is pleasurable, but the long-term effect of something uh, of that pleasure is not necessarily good. And so to, uh, is it, um, with, uh, you know, being, um, you, you know, selfish, oh, it might feel good to not have children and to spend all my money on myself and to pursue my own, my own desires, whatever they may be, mm -hmm. but you'll wind up sad and alone. And that's sad. Uh, so, we are, but what if you we don't, are, we, are, to... we are beings that are created to be in families units. Uh, just how God made it. And it's fairly obvious whether you are, you know, a Christian or whether you are, you know, uh, you know, from the 1700s living in Japan, you live in family units. It's just the nature of humanity uh, to, to live like that. And it's a good thing. Um, it's a happy thing. It's a positive thing. And what if you're so poor that. that you can't give, what if you're so poor that you can't give your children a meaningful and a happy life that they're just going to be I mean, you know, they, they might only, they might have to share a room. They might have to. Uh, well, am I talking you know, to Karl Marx here or to Swig? Well, I don't know. You influenced me last time that <laughs> I, uh, that maybe I've just conditioned to be a Marxist anyway. So, so you're saying that's a Marxist idea to say that, that children need to have economic lives. Uh, I would say, yeah, yeah. I mean, yes and no. I, children need to be provided for. Um, we are living in the wealthiest, uh, time period where we have access to all kinds of things that humanity has never had access to before. The poorest person now lives like a King, uh, you know, 800 years ago. Um, and so to say, oh, I'm too poor to have children. Well, no, you're not. You're not. You, you don't you, buy you, it. 
I don't. I don't believe it. No. Um, people have been having children for, for millennia and have been desperately poor. You're not that. Um, and so, again, I would say that we are created to, to, to do this. And yes, money is a necessity uh, in order to live. Um, but, you know, God provides. So, um, you know, have children, love them, live according to the plans that God uh, has for, for us as human beings. Couldn't a lot of children cause fighting among parents and potentially divorce? That wouldn't be good. Uh, well, it, yeah, people can get divorced. Um, but if, if, uh, you think it's the children that's causing it, you're wrong. Well, they're, they're kind of in the way sometimes that's what people fight about a lot. Children. Um, I, you know, I don't know. I think they're much more likely to fight about infidelity, pornography, uh, one of the spouses misusing the family funds, uh, rather than, um, children. Children are again, typically and naturally a blessing. Um, I mean, I suppose if you have some demon child, it could be a problem, but that doesn't, <laughs> doesn't seem real, real likely. So All right. let's, let's jump into talking about the Christian life. We brought up the happy society, um, which mm -hmm. is, seems a little bit more of a secular way of saying it, but I don't think they're disconnected in your mind. What is the Christian life? Um, you talked about how family is a huge part of that. Is there, are there other parts to that? Yeah, so I would say that, um, you know, even more broadly, uh, what does it mean to be a faithful Christian? Okay. Um, and uh, what does that look like? Well, first, there's a lot of um, kind of Protestant, if you will, uh, almost euphemisms for what it means to be a Christian. You know, I've been saved or so-and-so got saved. Uh, it's kind of a popular fundamentalist way of talking back in the 80s and 90s. Mm -hmm. Um, evangelicals are much more comfortable talking about having a personal relationship with God, mm -hmm. almost as if uh, Jesus is your boyfriend. Um, and if you need evidence for that, just look at the lyrics of literally any praise song. And that's what it says. Basically, you think Jesus. they're like love letters? Yeah, uh, yeah. Well, very bad ones. So, but why is that? Why is having passion? I mean, people can mentally separate that in their in their minds why is just having passion and desire uh, maybe not romantic is the right word but having a sort of zeal for god why is that well, why is that a bad thing well zeal for god is is good and even you know it's kind of a funny way of saying it and maybe implies certain things uh when you say having a personal relationship with god i'm not i'm not saying that that's necessarily a bad thing that's not my argument i'm saying that's not the fullness of what god creates us to be Okay. The fullness of what God creates us to be is far beyond, quote, just being or uh, being saved or having a personal relationship with God. That's my point. And, and when being I hear saved personal... is good and having a relationship with God is good. Those are fine, depending on what you mean by those things. Um, that's all good, but that's not the fullness of living the Christian life. Those are. When I hear personal relationship, I hear a little bit of the internalization of the self, Rousseau, the romantics. Is Absolutely. that okay? That's yeah, yeah, that's, that's part of the concern. But again, like I, I say, I mean, what do you mean by that? But again, it tends to be an isolating sort of a thing where I have my Bible reading time in the morning or my prayer time in the morning uh, by myself, or maybe I, I go to church on Sunday, and then the rest of my my life is sort of separated from the Christian life, and I pursue my economic interests like I was taught in my, my capitalist schools, um, or I pursue my, uh, my, my own, um, you know, self-identity, whatever that is, and find fulfillment there. And it's disconnected, like there, there's a fragmentation of one's life, and that is not the Christian life. That is not the fullness of the Christian life anyway. So what should a Monday um, look like for a Christian? Other than, you know, if, if it's not doing your economic adventures or, you know, fulfilling your identity, identity, doing hobbies and stuff like that. What is it like? What does that look like? For a yeah. Well, I mean, it's, it's not real hard. It's just living well within the various vocations that you have. That's what it means to be a Christian. Um, and so, it's not so obvious to people to just do what you do kind of, no. it just sounds like you're saying, do what you do basically. Well, but, but 
yeah, do the vocations that God has given you to do. So are you a, a husband? Be a good husband. Are you, you know, obviously you're a Christian, you're a Christian husband, be a good Christian husband. Are you a Christian father? Be a good Christian father. Do you work at some place in order to support your family, which is the main purpose for, for a job? Well, be good at that. Um, and that, by the way, is way down the list because you can do lots of different things to support your family um, and to support your church community. And um, so, so live well within those vocations and don't see them as disconnected because they're not. And um, with this fragmentation that has tended to happen, and I think it is implied oftentimes within the schooling that we've, we've had, you know, um, if you have a Christian school, that's basically the John Dewey model with a little bit of Jesus sprinkled on top in a couple different places, then really that's what you have. You, you have the, the, the secularist model guiding the purpose of your education with a little bit of Jesus mixed in. But those are, are two, different, two different things that are kind of separate. Rather, um, orienting properly our vocations uh, is important. Obviously, being a Christian uh, is number one, but also that doesn't mean just that you have Jesus in your heart or, or wh whatever it is, uh, being baptized or whatever it is. There's more to that. It's, it's about being a. Uh, it's about uh, being made right with God. Um, to use sort of a theological language, to be justified by mm -hmm. God's grace. Uh, and then once, and of course, you know, as a Lutheran, I believe that that happens in the waters of holy baptism and the Word of God, which pronounces this to you and claims you as one of God's own. Uh, it's about being formed by Christ, and you are formed by by God by Christ with a variety of different things. Um, you are uh, formed by Christ through the words of the Holy Scriptures and memorizing that and taking that into yourself and letting that form you is a good habit. And that might be part of what being a Christian is, is doing that because it forms you and turns you into more and more of the likeness of Christ. There's different words for what I'm talking about here. Some use the word sanctification. Um, that has some baggage to it. Others use the word uh, theosis in the, in the Orthodox uh, uh, communion. Uh, they would say that we are being uh, transformed, becoming more like uh, sons of God, divinized sons of God is kind of their language for it. It's a little weird. Um, and then, uh, you know, I actually like uh, Pastor uh, Jordan Cooper's word for, for it, maybe the best, because it doesn't have a lot of baggage. And it really describes it the best. Rather than sanctification, he uses the word uh, Christification. And so part of living in the fullness of God is being transformed into being more and more like Christ. And what does that mean? What does it mean to be made more and more like Christ? Well, it means to be made more human, frankly. Um, the first Adam failed and sinned, but the second Adam redeems. The second man, Christ, redeems and restores and transforms. And... Um, and so living in the fullness of what it means to be human, even though we still have our sinful nature, we are being transformed by Christ if we are living as Christians. And so then how do we, how do, we do that? How do we make this happen? Well, obviously, before we, be, yeah, yeah, maybe before, there, before we go into how we make that happen, I'll put a pin in that. Let's define some of those things a little bit clearer. So what I'm hearing you okay. say is justification is, and I want to be careful to, because we probably have mostly evangelical audience to use language that they would reckon with. Okay. Like that's forgiveness. Is that kind of what I'm hearing? That's like, God is, yeah. is saying you're good. You're, you're covered. Yes. Yeah. I mean, there's, there's a variety of different ways to think about it. So okay. um, yeah. So to be made right with God, okay. uh, so you're no longer his enemy to be made right with God so that the darkness of your sin is covered by the whiteness of Christ. And, and so is, this white so baptism is, is historically where the, uh, the baptized person uh, is dressed in white because they're putting on Christ because Christ, Christ's righteousness is being put on them. Um, and so, I mean, there, there, there's visual images of it. There's ways to talk about it, but, but you're no longer God's enemy. You are now a part of God's church. Another way to think about it, and again, I think baptism is historically, obviously, the way that this happens is that you are marked. You are now God's. God puts his name on you, puts mm -hmm. his name on your, on your head and on your heart. 
uh, in baptism. And so you are his. Um, but so that doesn't you... mean that you're like perfect. Uh, it means that you are claimed by Christ. You, there's still a process where you are going to be transformed to become more and more like Christ. Okay, two questions. So one, what if you are marked by Christ, let's say when you're a baby, um, mm -hmm. you're baptized, or when you're older, yep. and, and then you walk away from Christian, Christ, the Christian life. You never go to church after that. You don't care about God. You know, you're, you're running around with the, with the demons in Oregon. Do they, does, that does that take you out of the faith, or are you good? Like, Oh, it yeah. So, you know, um, less John Calvin is listening. Um, let me just be clear. The church has always taught that one can, you know, one can be marked by God, but, but then lose that because of a variety of different, uh, reasons. So yeah, you can walk away from, from your baptismal covenant purposefully. Um, you can walk away with, I think more often what happens is, you walk away, if, if you do walk away from your Christian faith, you do so because your faith is not being, being sustained. It's not being, you know, it's like a plant that needs water. Why do or you say that passively, not being sustained? Wouldn't you be the one sustaining it? Well, again here, so we're falling, coming into some theological uh, um, distinctives here, but mm -hmm. historically from the Christian perspective, God is the one who does the watering. I mean, you have to show up to be watered, I guess, but, um, but God is the one who waters you. He, he, yeah. So the, so in baptism, um, but then to use the words of, uh, the blessed Saint, uh, Ignatius of Antioch, um, it is necessary for us to participate in, in frankly, sacraments, the, the bread of immortality is what he calls communion. And the, okay. And, and Cyprian, uh, you know, a, a contemporary, well, actually later, probably a hundred years later than Ignatius said that God is not your father without the church as your mother. Is that yeah. kind of along the same lines? Yeah. Yeah, of course. Yeah. There, there's no such thing. Well, the, again, you know, there, there's no such thing as an individualist human that just exists by themselves without any other human. It requires two humans to create a human right? Humans do not live in complete isolation. They but can't. what does that have to do with the church? I mean, yeah, we could have families, but why can't we, why, why is the church necessary? The church is necessary because, <laughs> because Jesus says it is, and because it's just natural that it, that it is. Um, we are familial creatures. We are beings that require community. We require community, obviously, to even come into being, into existence. God himself is a community, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. Uh, the, the church is called the bride of Christ, not the brides of Christ, right? J Jesus is not po a polygamist, mm -hmm. right? <laughs> he, has, he has one bride, and that's his that's, holy Catholic and apostolic church. That's going to be the name of this episode. <laughs> Jesus is not a polygamist. Jesus is not a polygamist. Um, and so, uh, so yeah, the, the church is necessary. It's all over the Bible. It's just obvious in, in the reality of it. And in order for our faith to be watered, um, we need the bread of immortality. We need the bread of life. We need to take Christ into ourselves in order to continue to be transformed by him. And so many people uh, that do fall away, fall away because of their own laziness. They are no longer participating in the bread of immortality. Um, they're no longer partip participating in the, the sacraments or hearing God's word or being um, uh, enriched by their community of fellow Christians. And so their faith withers and dies. Um, and that would fit well with the, the idea of Christian vocation that in the middle of the week, I'm kind of picturing the, the Monday through Saturday is where you should still be spending time with your Christian brothers and sisters, your, um, you know, your church mates, because Absolutely. that, because that waters you as well. Is that kind of what you're saying? That it's not just the Sunday it is communion, but it's not just communion. It is, you know, the Bible. It is the daily devotions, but it's not just that. Absolutely, yeah. And and when you don't have your uh, your your fellow Christians from the church, you know, if provided you're married, you have your spouse who's from your church, mm -hmm. and you've got your children, and hopefully you lead them in family devotions, um, and and model 
um, what it looks like. To, and when I say family de devotions, I don't mean, you know, um, just a little prayer. I mean, you actually, you know, sing hymns as a family and learn the catechism or, or learn the Ten Commandments, uh, memorize parts of scripture together. These are good things um, that is very, like, very directly focused on, on God that you should do all week. Uh, and so by doing these things, um, then we are becoming Christified. We are becoming more and more like Jesus. That sounds like um, a lot to ask for a family to, to sing hymns in the living room, to, you know, do more, to wake up and read scripture all together, to memorize the same passage at the same, you know, yeah. how, how can you expect that of, of people? Uh, easy. Thou shalt have another gods before me. It's first commandment that we should fear, love, and trust God above all things. That means you have to prioritize God. So can we yep. not enjoy, can we not go to the bowling alley? Can we not have sports teams? Can we not enjoy each other? At, you know, at, at the park. Well, I'm not saying that you, you should you should only do devotions all day long every day. Um, that would be ignoring other vocations that you have. Okay. Um, but that but that is one, and that may be the most important one. I would say that is the most important one. The most important one is taking your family to church on Sunday. But you should do more than that if you can, um, is what I'm saying. And, and so uh, by, by doing that and living well within our vocations, we are living in the fullness of God. And so that's what I wanted for my, for my children. And so, um, yeah. So you're in Casper. And, and so tell us about how your children needed Casper more than Western Oregon. Yeah, um, two things. Uh, would come to mind here. First and foremost, in order to uh, to live sort of in the in the fullness of of the Christian life, it needs to be directly and consistently taught. And where we were in Western Oregon, um, even in the Christian school that we were at, uh, that just wasn't happening. Um, that would happen some at our church, uh, but it needs to be uh, taught. And it needs to be secondly. Um, and these, there needs to be a active uh, Christian community amongst the students as well. There was a uh, quote that I heard from a podcaster I listened to that if it's not a formal rule or if it's not a formal position, it will be lost. Yeah. And so, and so that kind of fits along with the, yeah, you could, you know, teach your children at home in the evenings when you guys all get, get home from school, you could have your, uh, you know, community that you really try to meet up at, you know, at a certain time every week and, and hang out with your church friends. But if it's not formalized, if it's not almost institutionalized, it's, it's easily slips the mind it easily, um, you know, can become second. Um, is that kind of along the same lines as having the school be the thing they go to daily, the thing, you know, taught by people of your church? Uh, yeah, absolutely. Um, if it's not intentionally being done, it will be lost is kind of what you were saying. And so um, we found here in Casper, Wyoming, a classical Lutheran school where the headmaster is uh, one of the pastors at the church, Mount Hope uh, Lutheran Church, and um, fully committed to uh, teaching the a Christian faith, as well as uh, the classical education, which we'll talk about, mm -hmm. um, sort of the fullness of uh, what it means to be uh, a, a learner and a Christian uh, by focusing on the great Western tradition, which is primarily uh, formulated um, because of the, of the Christian faith, which is why, by the way, also you have your John Deweys of the world that d they really do not like uh, Christianity. They want to see Christianity to, uh, to be rejected. And um, so moving away from the teaching of Western civilization was a design of the Deweyites. And they've done that successfully. Western civilization is not taught or celebrated. It is completely disparaged. And um, in doing so, also the religion of the West is disparaged, which has formed much of the culture. So basically, Dewey deconstructs western civilization with his schooling and that ends up becoming the foundation of our public schooling that's a good place to stop we'll talk about the antithesis of public 
Dewey education later in our episode on classical education. This is Cook and Swig. We'll see you guys next time.